We can hear you now, just for the record. Oh, I don't, I don't know if they heard the first thing you just said, but we can hear you now, officially. Officially? What? Officially. <clears throat> Good morning, oh everyone. Goodness. Hopefully things are... I'm going to go ahead and just check to make sure things are running in the background because I have no confidence whenever I do something new, and this is very much as new. Uh, but if you have just joined the show, uh, let us know if you can hear and see and uh, do all those things. And Megan, Devin, you want to do a sound check for everyone there? Sound check. Sound check. Sound check. Okay. Professor Meg reporting for duty. Okay. Oh, that sounded way cooler than mine. We can already see yeah. successful geek in the comments, so we know something isn't working. Um, but... <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are diving into the new weekly live show over on, uh, well, on Board Game Co., the, the weekly live show, the something or other. We don't yet have a name for this, honestly. Whoever no, comes up with an it, amazing you're name. killing it. You're Megan. doing so good right now. <laughs> we don't yet have a name. Uh, successful, we did debate doing Megan Alex in the morning and also Devin. <laughs> that was on the short list. Decided not to. A little too inside can, can joke. Can we make that the only list? That's amazing. I want, I want a community reference in which... I am an addendum. Yes, that was that was definitely on my short list. I started it off this morning. I was like, that would be a good name. And then I was like, you know what? We're going to hold off on that. Uh, this is the weekly live show. We have no format. We have, well, it's not true. We have a format. We have a format. We do have a format. We're going to <laughs> loose, loosely wow. stick to it. Uh, it might be crazy all over the place. I don't know. It also might be a podcast. That's also part of the thing. Additionally, it has a Patreon, uh, Patreon influence on the topics, like including this week. One of the topics is Patreon voted, and in the future will be Patreon selected. Uh, it will Patreon. be up there apparently for everybody who's watching <laughs> up there down there there'll be patreons uh devin do you have a patreon yet uh no i'm thinking about starting one i haven't started one you should yet. do that yeah. i know meg's thinking about starting one but she's also thinking about cutting her hair so who knows but yeah <laughs> the inside joke started early uh so basically uh, we're gonna go ahead and start this off at some point we'll have a countdown timer as well so that we can not riff for two minutes and starting off the show uh but yeah. from there <laughs> what what happened to the countdown timer that you have i don't so, I was confused why that wasn't used. Uh, we could use that one. It's just an issue of getting it all set up uh, in the morning. That's all. We're just getting it all set up and just starting it off. That's all. Okay. Yeah, we could do that. That one's so fully functional. It could. We should get you new music. I was about to say. We should. We do need music. Uh, good morning. So, basically, what's going to be happening here is this is sort of replacing the Wednesday live show. I may switch, switch to also having a live show at some point so I can do Q&A because I like the interaction of Q&A. This will be interactive to a degree, but a drop less interactive. Uh, to that end, Devin and Meg, I don't know if you have chat options up, but if you do, you don't have to, but if you do and you see things you want to call out, by all means. Yeah, I, I have the chat open. You know, I just, I've just decided to be an adult. Yeah. Uh, Stacy, the topic of the week uh, when we dive into the Patreon section is going to be how do you select a game for game night? We're going to be getting into that part later, though. But I guess starting off the bat, this is, again, loosely format formatted, and I do have a 11 o'clock hard cutoff today. Uh, that's not always the case, but today it definitely is. <laughs> and so with that, let's go ahead and start off with our first topic. Well, actually, let's introduce people. Oh, sweet, guys. I just noticed you can see all my babies drool. That's amazing. I couldn't until now. <laughs> Yeah, but starting off the bat, was just going to be a brief introduction for those who haven't seen Devin and Meg on the channel, which have, they've been on plenty of videos at this point, but if in case you haven't, uh, we have Devin from Devin Talks Tabletop, who's a delightfully semi-charming person. I'm mostly going to insult Devin. That's, I think I'm realizing this now. <laughs> semi-charming human it's being. It's not going to leave me any room to insult myself. Thanks a lot. Uh, but he has a channel called Devin Talks Tabletop. You should definitely check that out. Uh, and he and I have been uh, friends and interacting for what, going on two years now? Yeah, I'd say it's about been two years, which, which is crazy to say that. You know, it's, it's, it feels like I only just met you. Feels so much longer. Oh yeah, that's what I meant too. Yeah. Uh, but past that, past that. Uh, then secondly, we have Meg. Uh, Meg, who I've been friends with since I guess February, arguably, maybe maybe later than that. I don't know exactly when. We met in like early in the year, and then it's, it's kind of started uh, doing more stuff together. Arguably around. friends. Arguably friends. Right. We've been arguably friends. Uh, but Meg from Professor Meg, and uh, over on Instagram as well as on YouTube, and I guess technically on yeah. Twitch as well. Uh, but those are. To be yeah. fair, arguably yeah. friends yeah. with yeah. Alex. Yeah. Ooh. A special I have guest. special guest. Oh, I don't, I don't have a special guest. I don't have yes. a pet. Uh, Reed McCullough, you're not wrong. I do say I have a hard cut off every week, but like I really have a hard cut off this week. <laughs> Maybe we'll see. The good news is, unlike usual weeks, I can just uh, hide my camera and let Devin and Meg take over while I ignore all of you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, like, Meg, do we want to do an outro? Yeah. This just me and you talking. The whole time. Yeah. I think that you should mute yourself and take your meeting so that we can voice over what we think you're saying. No, no, I'll hop into my other meeting, hide my camera. You can hear my other meeting the entire time. 
I definitely thought that that was Meg responding to me saying, yeah, we could do an outro with the two of us, but you, you just need to mute your mic. <laughs> so with that, let's go ahead and dive into the first topic of the week. And the topic of the week, this show is loosely, first of all, loosely controlled, expect chaos. But secondly, uh, the formats may change. We're going to pick and choose what people like. So feedback is definitely welcome. But to that end, starting off the bat with the uh, topic of the week, I guess we'll start with you, Meg, which is just any game, any game you want to talk about. Yeah, so I've been playing quite a few games recently, but one that I would love to talk about is Calico. So Ooh. Calico, I learned it was such a for good choice. By the way, you'll see soon why. But anyways, go ahead. Um, Calico, I learned for the first Meg time. Meg steals the show with the cat. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> oh, oh. Um, but I've been going through the solo mode. So Calico is a game where you're placing these patches and you're trying to get buttons and little cats and meet certain objectives. Um, and it's very cute, but the solo mode is so hard. And I really appreciate that, that I've been like replaying it and replaying it, that I finally be the fourth scenario, but I've tried it quite a few times. So just shout out to Calico that I really appreciate the solo mode that for such a cute game, um, and we usually score like pretty closely. It was very, very tough. Yeah, Calico's excellent. I've seen Charity Board Gamer saying he loves Calico more than Cascadia. I love Cascadia more than Calico, but both are absolutely fantastic. Uh, Calico's one that I've I've been playing it for a while now, and I only just, thanks to you, I just started playing the solo mode because you said it was hard, and I was like, ooh, let me try that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I even passed four yet. It's particularly challenging because they give you, uh, for those who know Calico, it's a game but uh, pat, uh, pattern tiles with cats loosely themed into it uh, but you're grabbing these tiles and putting them down to select different scoring goals uh, but part of the part that makes the score the the solo mode difficult is it's not just about getting a score it's about getting a score with particular achievements along the way so it's <clears> not <throat> if you're good at calico but you haven't figured out how to get like all the rainbow buttons that might be a problem for you if you're good at calico but haven't figured out how to get specific sequences and you're only good at one thing and not another you're going to have to struggle to uh, get that all to work so uh, yeah the solo mode is definitely a lot meg have you played verdant and cascadia cascadia but not verdant you've played okay gotcha w out of those two which ones which one do you prefer i would say i prefer calico just because of the aesthetic um, and I also like being locked into that board where just like brain wise and trying to figure out the puzzle, I think my brain works better within the border as opposed mm. to like building out. Um, I think Cascadia is great, but compared to the two, I'd rather play Calico. Yeah, I, I, I haven't played any of those three, but uh, <gasps> out of, speaking of cat games that I've played with you guys, though, that Explore and Draw Isle of Cats, that I did enjoy yeah. that. That was a fun one. I love that um, one. But now I, I need to play one of these three games at some point. Well, I can dive straight into the next one because my choice of the week was Verdant. Verdant was my choice for this week. Cool. You uh, guys are so boring. It oh just goodness. arrived this past just week. Off and like, I'm just like this random person by myself. Devin, it's okay. while I talk about Verdant, you can spend two and a half minutes researching Cascadia and pretend you've played Cascadia. That'd be perfect. Okay. All right. I'll Calico. get started. We could play Calico on Tabletopia. Absolutely. Later. We could. So, v Verdant just arrived this past week for me. Uh, Verdant's part, for those who don't know, there's currently the trilogy of Cascadia, Calico, and Verdant. They're also coming out with Fit to Print as an upcoming Kickstarter, which will also have points going, but re real time mixed in. But from Verdant, uh, Verdant was, or I should say, is my least favorite of the three, which is, take that with a grain of salt, because I like all three of these games. Uh, but Cascadia is my favorite so far, with an interesting caveat that. I want to play the solo of Cascadia more now that I've been diving into the solo to see how it lines up. Uh, but Calico, I've really enjoyed the solo mode a lot. I really enjoyed the game a lot, and the solo mode has been a fascinating brain burner of a puzzle. And so Verdant recently showed up, and I've already had a chance to dive back into that one, uh, both solo and multiplayer. I played the prototype during the campaign, and since it just came in, I wanted to dive into it. Uh, to that end, I find that Verdant is still delightfully charming. I think I prefer the puzzle of Calico in general, and that's going to hold true for solo as well. The main complaint I have on Verdant right now is the fact that, and it's still early levels, but the solo mode has 15 levels compared to Calico's 10, and because I've been diving into the solo mode, I've started going through it, and the initial ones, the first like five or so, just have scoring as a goal, and do not have specific criteria around those scoring. And because of that, I have found that it is too easy. Calico, I think yeah. I played Calico solo maybe like... 20 times and only gotten three levels accomplished it's that hard like it really is a challenge and verdant i've played three times and won each of the three times so i still very much enjoy it it still has a fascinating mechanism of uh, verdant's plant based and you're trying to match up specific rooms with specific plants that go in those rooms and they all have to pair up in a way that ultimately will never score perfectly although unlike calico 
you know you can't score perfectly. Calico offers you the potential premise of perfection that crashes and burns every time you play it, versus Verdant doesn't do that. Verdant's like, nope, you're just gonna have to figure out how to get the most points, but you're not gonna get perfect. And so to that end, I do enjoy that aspect of the game, and I do enjoy the multiple scoring criteria. Uh, the solo mode is an area, though, that I'm feeling is weaker, considering how much I appreciate the challenge that Calico presents. And given how much I know of uh, Cascadia and Verdant and Calico from my um, just <laughs> numerous plays, I'd say that that rather exhaustive explanation... Now I know why you have to have hard cutoffs, um, but uh, yeah, no, it definitely definitely makes sense to me. My game, curiously enough, uh, is Cascadia. So wow. really crazy that we all picked uh, those three ones. And obviously for everybody else who's familiar with Cascadia, um, the one to four player game designed by Randy Flynn is one of my favorites. And I love that it um, is a really good abstract that... I believe it's the number uh, one rated abstract on Board Game Geek, if I'm not mistaken. It, 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 yes, it is. Um, I know that because I looked that up recently. Um, mm -hmm. Just going to close this tab real quick. And <laughs> 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 so my game uh, <laughs> is Lost Ruins of Arnak um, because uh, the three of us have planned a play this, not that, between Lost Ruins of Arnak, Dune Imperium, and Endless Winter. And caveat, caveat, for I, those who are like, but doesn't Alex already have that on his channel? Yes, but not with multiple opinions, and this is incorporating all the expansions. How does our opinion change with expansions? Not opinions. Mm, yes. That is also what I understood to be the case. I didn't think it was just us talking about the base games. Um, yes. So, now that we're all on the same page, which we already were, um, <laughs> I had never played Lost Dreams of Arnak, so Alex taught me very recently on Board Game Arena, and it's always enjoyable to be taught a game by Alex when he uh, intimately knows all of the ways to destroy you, and then showcases it. I actually, Meg, you'll appreciate this. <laughs> he Did started teaching. No, he started teaching the. I mean, he can't on BGA. It forces him to score correctly. Um, <laughs> But, but uh, oh my gosh! Hey, Henry Audubon's in the in the chat. Henry, hey, Henry, how's it going? Can we no, and talk about oc uh, octa Cosm octopus all of a sudden? No, because then I won't have a topic for later. Oh, shut, 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 never mind, never mind. Later, later. <laughs> shut up. We'll talk about it later. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So Meg, we're playing, and he, Alex, is doing his classic teach, and he's like, "Are you with me? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, are you with me? Cool, cool, cool." And he gets like eight minutes in and I just go, Oh, okay. And I immediately move to a location and I go, is that how I go to a location? And Alex just like pauses with obvious distress on his face. And he goes, did you just make a move in the game without knowing the context of what, how that could help you? And I was like, yes, a hundred percent. Yes. Like this is my first time playing this game. I don't give a crap. <laughs> and, and he goes, so now it's my turn. And I now am going to hold you hostage because it's my turn in BGA. And I'm going to finish explaining the rules. And I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but so he did He did just absolutely destroy me 90 to 61. So uh, it was it was a it was a but I had a lot more fun playing the game. I kind of had a like, stigma towards um, Lost Ruins of Arnak because I love Dune Imperium so much. I was like. There's just no way I'm going to like Lost Runes of Arnak anywhere close to Dune Imperium. And, and it's still like, if I still have to pick between the two, I'm picking Dune Imperium. But one play, Lost Ruin, one play. But No, but I'm trying to say, but Lost Runes of Arnak is so different that I really don't even see the fact that, like, other than the deck building that they do and the fact that it also has worker placement, other than those two mechanics... I see absolutely no reason as to why that was such like an intense furor of like comparison between the two when they came out. Can I offer two points of context there? Okay. No, no, no. I'm gonna let Meg talk because oh, uh, ahead, it Meg. takes the two of us to shut you up. So. <laughs> Go ahead, Meg. I don't have. I, yeah. I Devin's like I'm gonna let Meg. <laughs> so back to me. Point. Two points like, of context. What is my point? Let me pull it out. The of first here. is: Do you at least acknowledge that many people do compare it, even if you don't personally see it? 
Yeah, no, I, I, I know right. a lot of people do. Can yeah. we also acknowledge that you tried comparing Dune Imperium to Twilight Imperium? Uh-huh. Okay, good. Now that we've established different points of reference on what opinions matter here. <laughs> anyway, so how is Lost Meg, in Meg, you better have a... Oh, I'm. I, he can't beep live, so Meg, you better have a point uh, to interrupt him now. Uh-huh. Yeah, deck building's great. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yes, yes. Yeah, deck building is great. Super good. All Love that it. mechanic. And, and Stacy is pointing out in chat <clears throat> that I destroyed you in the game I was teaching, and I definitely agree with that. With two with meaning, meaning from a completely side topic, but teaching a game and destroying people, I den generally don't recommend. I think it's better to <clears throat> be easier going when you teach a game. Uh, but what I would say two caveats. First is that it's Devin, so I don't care. Um, and secondly, <laughs> oh, here's all. <laughs> the second is that he literally started making his moves before I finished teaching the game. It's not my yeah. fault I destroyed him, it's his. Yeah, you started him <laughs> off angry. <laughs> no, He's I, like, you, you're not going to play optimally? Oh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. To yeah. be fair, Devin, Alex is used to teaching me games, and I usually beat him the first time he teaches me a game. So I think he just had the difficulty level up a little too high for you. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I also suck, but what? Yeah. Anyway. You just gotta make sure that Alex is counting everything correctly, because that doesn't always happen. It, it's BGA. I don't have a choice. But do you, though? But do you? Challenge that. So with that, <laughs> uh, Devin, do you want to go ahead and, and pivot to uh, your, your Kickstarter of the week that may or may not be something we talked about? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if Henry's still in the chat, uh, my goal was to... So I know that we've got all like big campaigns. You've got Slay the Spire. You've You've got Cthulhu, Death May Die, you've got Oathsworn, and I have, you know, thoughts and opinions on those, but the one that I wanted to give the shout out to is actually Cosmoctopus. I recently on my channel did a interview with the designer, Henry Audubon, who was in the chat uh, just earlier, and then also um, the publisher, K uh, Chris Kingsnorth, who's part of Paper Fort Games, which is a sister company to Stone Sword Games, for those of you who are familiar with games like Senjutsu, um, and so... Cosmoctopus is the next one from Henry, uh, and he's the designer of Parks, if you're familiar with Parks. And this is a game that I got to see in person for the first time at Essen. I didn't have the time or opportunity to sit down and play it, but it looks just sumptuous. Everything about the graphic design on that I love, and I am super excited to check it out. So this was kind of my like, hey, if you don't know anything about Cosmoctopus, go check that out, because uh, they've successfully funded, but obviously... Um, you know, I want to give Henry as much love as possible because uh, he's he's an awesome guy, and him and Chris have done such a great job with that game, which yeah. I'm super excited to play. That one is very much on my radar. I, I don't have a good full sense of exactly how it plays. I know the general the general sense of what's shown on the campaign page, but like actually playing is something I want to do. But it seems very puzzly. And as we talked about with Calico, Cascadia, Virgin, and all that, I very much enjoy puzzly style games, and I love Parks. And so between the two, and the fact that we just have a Cthulhu styled octopus situation going on, um, I'm very intrigued by Cosmo Octopus, and it's very much a game that I absolutely want to try at some point. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm super excited about it. They're also going in the um, intelligent marketing vein of uh, Flamecraft, and they have little plushy octopuses that you can get at their, on the campaign. So, yeah, but super excited about it. There you go. And Henry apparently still is in the chat for those uh, paying attention. But yes. Awesome. Hey, Henry. And the octopus are I tough. I did not hear about the plushes. So yeah. I I wanted to back. I chopped over to the campaign. I'm still on the fence with it to back it away for retail. But like, I was like, I saw that they had an early bird for the for the plushy octopus, and I was like, I missed that. I would have totally jumped <laughs> in for that. Now it's like, yeah. okay, do I do? We'll figure it out. But either way, it looks. But they also have it. It's not just an early bird. You can add it as an add on. Yes. To the campaign. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Max, like, oh my god, oh my gosh. Oh what my are god. you waiting for? Um, now, also, just for those who are excited, really announced the format aspect, but basically we have three different sections to this uh, weekly live stream, whatever it's going to be, but in between those sections, we're going to have people picking random, uh, Kickstarter, not random, selected Kickstarters that they want to talk about. So you're going to see three sections and two Kickstarters every week. That's going to be the basic format, at least until we immediately change it next week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love how you're like, guys, this is our structure. It's definitely going to survive one week. Well, it has to survive this week, maybe. <laughs> um, but Maybe. 
with that, we can go ahead and dive into the, 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 the random topic of the week. The random topic, the next section we have, is literally just the dealer's choice. Uh, whatever someone wants to talk about, whether it's board games, whether it's a topic, whether it's, uh, I don't know, whatever it is. In my case, I'll start off with this one, because I just want to talk about um, Henry Cavill and him not being in The Witcher anymore. Oh. <laughs> What's up with I didn't that? realize Aww. that the pre-chat was going to turn into live stream chat. The pre-chat we had was definitely going to be the live stream chat. So, so... so here's here's the only thing that I interpreted from that. I sure. interpreted one of two possibilities because I, I haven't read too I much have other than like the initial um, like news and then some very like random speculation. But my assumption is one of two things. Number one, uh, the game, the video games themselves, like actually sometimes go to different parts of Ger Geralt's like history and time, uh, like his age and like what he's doing. And so one of the things that I wondered is because it's not like I, I, I think part of the like some people who just look at it without understanding, like or looking, reading it, and they just see the title. Um, like season three is already Henry Cavill, yes. you know, so he, he's in that. It's just, they've already immediately, um, uh, re pledged for season five <laughs> pledged. That's not any term outside of board games. Um, they've, they've, they, they've agreed to a season four already or green lighted. And then that's the season that, uh, you know, Liam Hemsworth is going to be a part. So my, one of my guesses was that they're switching the time period of how old, Witcher will be um, like you know how old Geralt's going to be in the show and then the other thing that I was wondering is because I know for sure that the original two seasons had kind of like a younger less experienced um, showrunner and you know she's carried it through season two I'm assuming she's part of season three but what I was wondering is um, like Henry has such a close attachment to the series. I'm wondering if as a actor, he was like more vocal than some actors would be about what they feel like is like continuity and like uh, loyalty to who the character is. And if there was any change in showrunner, you know, you know, directors, producers, and if any of that upper leadership shifted and changed and the new people didn't like him having as much input, he might not have felt comfortable staying. So part of it was like me wondering if there were creative differences that grew after the season three, you know, production cycle was done. And then the other thought I had was if the time period changes. So but I yeah, I was, I was curious about that too. Yeah, so I can say <clears throat> for a few things. I mean, I do know that there was even just a oh, year Henry ago. had signed on for seven seasons, someone said. I don't know if that's true. I didn't see that anywhere. Oh if that's true, that's that's interesting. Um, that's very interesting. But yeah, I do know that uh, the last year, there was note about how he was clashing with them, and in multiple interviews, he has mentioned that, that aspect, that he wishes were a bit more faithful to the books. So there definitely is that difference. I don't know if that led to the decision. Um, obviously, there's also the fact that he has recently signed on for Superman again, as well as the next Justice League, which was up in the air for a while. And so that's an obvious question mark on schedule, although he has said in the past he can definitely do a movie and the TV show at the same time. And then there's all these fan stuff going around on YouTube, YouTube, which is not on YouTube, on Facebook, I'm just seeing tons of fan speculation about him signing on uh, for House of the Dragons content. If he wants to be like another, no spoilers or anything, but if he wants to be someone in that show, uh, that that would be very, very cool. I'm guessing he's that just like so used to wearing white hair now that they're exactly. like, let's go to the other show that we exactly. were, we were watching. <laughs> And so, like, I don't actually expect that to happen, but it would be very cool because, I mean, I love The Witcher, uh, but I also love House of Dragon, and it would be cool to see uh, to see Henry Cavill in that role, and it would make me feel slightly better about his absence from a show that I will never, ever watch again after season three. Yeah, I he's so perfect for that role. You could have just finished after he's so perfect. We would have been fine. Yes. <laughs> so I personally like it. To me, it's something like James Bond or whatever, where there's, I would rather the Witcher series continue for, or, or like Doctor Who, where I would want it to keep going. That like, it's not like Henry's going anywhere. He's still going to be in plenty of content and just a different person. Because um, I was thinking too, wouldn't it be great if he was like in the Marvel world somewhere and even doing like a Marvel show or something like that? And that's part of it. Mm. Um, I don't mind at all because I would rather Witcher content continuing and Henry continuing in other big budget things. Um, someone, someone in the chat is mentioning that he might be in line for Bond, and now I'm just like, now that just made me think of something that I was like, I kind of wish that the next Bond was just like 
all like seven bonds because we have like 007 and I just want the other six all at the same time to where I could have like Henry Cavill, Idris Elba, Daniel Craig, and like four other dudes all on screen at the same time. And then like Amber would have some competition. So <laughs> you're going to say you'd like the next James Bond to be someone like Michael Sarah or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I want the next James Bond to just like quietly be be timid and be a wallflower in the casino and be like, um, uh, yeah, I'd I'd like um, <clears throat> oh oh, that's that's the drink's not for me. <laughs> it's cool. I I didn't want it anyways. Um, yeah, no, that sounds like the coolest. <laughs> yeah, don't stir it. I don't want it to get too frothy. <laughs> yeah, but that's basically that's basically it. So that's my topic of the week, Devin. <laughs> oh, uh, random topic of the week is actually a shout out. So to all of you who are watching, you know, this is the inaugural weekly live show that Alex and Meg and also Devin um, are doing. <laughs> and and uh, the next thing that we are trying to take off is Meg and I are working so, so hard to finally try and make Alex be someone other than Alex. Good luck with that. And oh. we are going to start doing an RPG live play sometime in the near future. And I'm super excited about it. So I'm going to be the lore master, which is the one rings world term for like dungeon master or DM. So I'm going to be leading the charge on this in a narrative way, which is going to be awesome when I fall flat in front of anybody that watches. Um, and Alex has beautifully, very kindly set me up by saying that he's tried role-playing one time and the DM was so bad it ruined it for him. Yes. And that was that was how he set it up for me, is that oh, no. he said, oh, so, you know, no pressure, Devin, while we do this, you know, live. So I'm super excited. I've been reading through the core rulebook for The One Ring, um, and I'm, I'm getting ready to, you know, present that to, to them so that we can start building our characters. I'm super excited about it. Uh, I have quite a few RPG stuff, and this isn't like the only one that we'll do. We'll, we'll see how long we go into that, whether it's a short campaign, a medium campaign, but I've got Blades in the Dark, I've got Morkborg, I've got Alien, I've got classic D&D, so I'm super excited. Now, in the One Ring, do they have any characters that are like, I don't know, like maybe humans with like a slightly accountant data-driven background? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, uh, there's this one character in here that it, it just boring AF, I think is the race. Um, but so you can be Bardings, which I figured, I figured that Alex would be a like very, very calculating human trader. Um, I thought that would work well. Trader spelled T R A T O R, not A I T O R. <laughs> there's dwarves, <laughs> there's the elves of Linden, the hobbits of the Shire, the men of Bree, and then the rangers of the north. So those are all the different um, cultures, the heroic cultures that you can be. Cool, cool, cool. I'm excited. <clears throat> or nervous. Yep. One of the two. <laughs> you should be nervous. <laughs> Meg, to you. Um. So this is kind of, I. we didn't super plan this, but this is my topic. I kind of have a question for you guys, because I've brought this up before, but I've said if there's any game that I could eternal sunshine of the spotless mind and completely erase from my brain, uh, it would be Clank Legacy, so that I could just completely forget it, not even know the experience. I would even give up the memories that I had making it just to experience it again. So is there any game that you guys would love to completely wipe from your mind either because it was so upsetting or you had such a bad time with it that you'd like to give it a fresh start anything or I that you loved it so much that you'd love to play it again from the beginning what did she say Alex? anything i played with devin <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um it's a great question i don't know if i have an answer like i don't have i know you've talked about clank legacy before about that aspect uh you know that that the desire to forget it just so you can do it again um and it's such an interesting concept to me because for campaign games for me i think the only thing i have that possibly has that feeling would be pandemic legacy uh, but I don't know if I cared that much about the story. It was good. It was good. Don't get me wrong. But I don't know if I feel that, oh my gosh, I wish I could forget it just so I could re-experience it. And I don't know if I have any other games that fall into the category where I wish I could forget it so that I could re-experience I felt that way about books. I felt that way about movies. Games haven't inspired that level of devotion from me yet. 
that I can think of. And you have any where it was so bad that like you didn't pick it up again, but you wish you could pick up a game again? In what sense? Like, what do you mean? Uh, like, uh, Werewolf Legacy. I mm -hmm. had such a bad time. I don't know if I could ever play that game again. Hey, the Meg, could you, really bad. could you uh, turn up your volume for your mic on your computer at all? Just because okay. Alex and I already have the tendency to be loud and obnoxious, and apparently you're quiet there for quite a few yeah. people. I've seen yeah. that comment in the background. The only problem is I can adjust my yeah. volume versus the two of you. I can't separate the two of you, though. Mm. I don't know if I know how, I don't know if I can do that, but I can sit closer and talk louder. That would that would do it. For sit right now. closer, <laughs> talk louder. That sounds. What is that? Oh man, that sounds like. Is that a movie that came out? Like. Interesting. In what sense? Huh? What movie was that? Sit closer and talk louder. Yeah. Uh, closer, loud. There's some movie that has those descriptive words in it that I'm like that that just like sparked my brain. Anyways, um, let's see. Uh yeah, I, I'm kind of with Alex. Like, I, I usually don't have, at least with board games, such a visceral reaction that I want to, like, wipe it from my brain. Um, I have games that I love a lot, but the only game that's, like, legacy that I would have, that I've played all the way through that I would have ruined for myself would also be Pandemic Legacy. And if you had asked me, like, right after I finished that, maybe that would have been my answer. But now that it's so distant from when I played that, it's not that I've forgotten it. It's that that game is like no longer what I would want to spend like my legacy or campaign time with. Um, I've just kind of like shifted in terms of my preferences. So like, I, I don't think I've had one that was like so good that I'm like, oh my gosh, I need that to be an, an experience again. And then also like, I've had some bad experiences playing games, but it's generally not the fault of the game. It's generally who I'm playing with is like making the game like less uh, enjoyable an experience than the game itself. So if, if I have to pick something like Alex was talking about, like movies and TV shows and stuff like that, I would probably say I, I want the time back that I wasted on uh, Wheel of Time. The, <laughs> the, not the books absolutely not the books mm -hmm. the tv show i want the time back that i wasted on that tv show yeah so. successful first of all thank you for the tip i uh, now have users i'm able to now adjust the two of you in discord directly so that should yeah. hopefully be fine uh Alex, but past... that, that showed in the stream i know i saw i saw a pop-up <laughs> okay. yeah it's okay the button for delete and ban users also there um but anyways uh I, yeah in terms of if we're focusing on if we're focusing on getting time back, that's a whole different story. There's a lot of bad games I wish I could get the time back. Uh, but forgetting, yeah. I don't know if I care about forgetting them necessarily. I'm, I'm sure it'll happen one day. I'm sure it'll be a story at some point that I really do care about a lot more, uh, but I'm just not there yet. Sounds like we all need to play Clank Legacy together. Uh, I'm, I'm down Team for building. it. I've been very clear. I'm down for Clank Legacy. I'm down to try it out. Yep. And thanks, Maxim, as well. I appreciate it. Yes, I, I'm trying to like be balanced, responding to chat just a bit versus not enough that we derail the stream because I already have the two of you for that. But yeah, yeah, no, I'm 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 in the chats. I'm in the chats. I'm in there since I can't respond to comments right there. <laughs> I've got to respond to comments elsewhere. Which means from there, we can go ahead and dive into our next. Uh, well, before we dive into the next segment, we have our our, our next Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Meg, what do you have for us? Oh my goodness, you guys! Unfortunately, it's November 2nd, so it's a little bit past its time, but we can celebrate Halloween all of October and a little bit into November. Uh, the one I want to talk about is Dreadful Meadows, uh, which mm. is actually right behind Alex now. Um, it is. Dreadful Meadows nope. right now has, <laughs> it has 39 hours left to go, so it's only running a little bit longer, uh, but it is a delightful game. It's Halloween themed where you're playing as different, I don't know, sprites, spooks, whatever they are. Um, and you are collecting candy, it's tile placing, so you're grabbing tiles from a market, you're using that to generate candy, and then you're using the candy to both buy more tiles, buy, um... Harvesters. I want to say contractors, what's the thing? Harvesters. Harvesters. And, um, you're trying to meet different objective cards. So it's basically just an engine building game where you're trying to get as much candy as possible and use it in as many ways as possible. But boy, is it cute. It is very delightful. I had a great time playing it. Um, so much so that that's another one that I dove into the solo mode because I've been playing a lot more solo games, especially online. 
Um, and the solo mode was a bit easy. I played it a little wrong, so I think it still, it wouldn't have been as easy, but, um, solo mode wasn't quite what I wanted it to be, but competitively, it was so fun, and it's so cute. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's actually, I was hoping you'd mention that one, because that's one that I played as well. Uh, that's definitely one that I, I very much, it's one that I saw on Kickstarter, and looked charming, and looked also a little too family-friendly, though. Uh, and so the the good news is a lot of the people who had covered the game said specifically, no, this game has bite to it, this game has decision space around it. And to that end, I hopped onto Tabletopia to play it, uh, really enjoyed it, and Jesse had a copy, so I wrong shoulder. Jesse had a copy, and so I ran and got, picked it up, and I actually have a video going up today at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on the channel. I'm wondering, that is, that is figurative language. Alex has never run for anything. Um, he walked sedately over to there and picked it up. Yeah, that sounds about He right. did not run. I did not he run. He did not run. <laughs> yeah, but um, no, I grabbed the game. I, I also, and Meg, you mentioned playing solo, unless I played it wrong too, which <clears> I don't <throat> believe I did. Don't get me wrong, I play games wrong all the time. But um, in the solo mode, I also, my biggest critique about the game, I had two main critiques. I loved the game. I thought it was charming. I thought it was well done. I thought it had great decision space. Uh, but the two critiques I had is the first is I feel like I want the game to have more variability built into the experience. Uh, it's the kind of game that it's the same puzzle every single time. And so unless they have like goal cards or something to mix up what you're doing, right now the only thing to mix it up is the asymmetric characters, which is nice, but doesn't mix up what you're doing or what you're going for. Uh, but then secondly is I thought the solo mode was a straight up cakewalk. Not even a question. I thought it was a cakewalk like it's like hey beat this score and if you beat these scores you're doing really well so i crashed the really well and completely destroyed it and like i either i don't know i i either i'm playing it wrong or you probably cheated probably cheated it wasn't on it wasn't on board game arena so. it's just in your nature i mean he did it on lost runes of arnak too you know he he, he fudged the scoring <laughs> yeah well if the solo it. unlike you Devin, the solo mode at least way to take its freaking turn before i top the game <laughs> Yeah, that, maybe um, that's why you beat yeah, it so well, is you taught it the game. <laughs> yes, I Mike. think for the solo mode, it would benefit if they did something similar to Calico, where if it was like, you can't place trees next to trees, or you can only place two pink tiles total, or things like that. Wait till you watch um, my review that goes up at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, my suggestions that have nothing to do with what you just said. We work together too much. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, playing a lot of Calico recently solo has definitely inspired. In fact, one of my recommendations in the review is that is that uh, Calico as another game. And playing Calico solo definitely biased me towards that framework, that idea of it's not just about the score, which I think that score needs to be higher. It's also about the cats. It's also about the cats, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the mm -hmm. one. Jeremy it's Howard, please stay off Reddit. Cats. Jeremy Howard, don't worry, I've been off Reddit. And actually, if you actually look at the comments on Reddit, the comments are exactly the, the, the humanity that I expect. It's only one person, so we're all good there. But anyways, uh, moving on from there to our next topic. Oh, so also, Jeremy Howard, welcome aboard. Thanks for jumping in yeah. there. Good yeah. to see you. Yeah, let's do the thing that matters most. Hi, Jeremy! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, past that. So moving on to our next topic of the week, and this is the Patreon selected topic. Uh, every pay every week when you're figuring out the format and all that stuff, uh, right now we gave Patreon a bunch of topics to vote on, and uh, that's currently what we're going to be talking about, their selected topic. In the future, we may be trying to have them come up with their own topics and then vote within themselves, so it'll be fully Patreon and not like mm -hmm. semi-controlled by Alex, Devin, and Meg Patreon. But to that so end... So if you would like to be in charge of the Let's topic. be honest, Devin doesn't control anything. Like, I don't know why you added me in on that. <laughs> yeah. But if you guys want to choose a topic, head over to Patreon, become a patron of Board Game Co., and you can influence these live streams now. Dun dun dun. Yes, thank you, Meg. Appreciate that. Uh, but Power. I, in any case, the topic of the week, and I, I, I will start with Devin. I think Devin hasn't started anything. The topic of the week, Devin, is uh, how do you select a game for game night? So, this is, I'm going to answer this in a very Alexy way. So, I have four <laughs> answers. Very interesting question. Very interesting question. Okay, so let me rephrase the question. <laughs> so, first thing before we get into this, we have to understand that there. I can't even. I don't even want to talk that fast, and my brain doesn't even like function wait, at wait, that speed. Wait, so wait, I'm just going to slow call down. Call back. Call back. If you want to answer it in Alex way, just be like, "Well, that's a <laughs> stupid question." <laughs> so, anyways, <laughs> someone petrified in chat just goes, "Devin's just happy to be here." <laughs> Oh, I worry sometimes about the image of myself I project to the world. Um, <clears throat> it's too accurate. Um, so in terms of like how to pick a game for game night, to me, it depends first on who all is coming. Like it depends on 
the number of people and the types of players that you're playing with. If it's like your regular play group and they all share a lot of your own interests, then your choices are different. But like for me, where I live, if I'm not playing with like Alex or not, not well, Alex and Meg when they come visit, but if I'm not playing with Allison and Daniel from Play the Game or I'm not playing with Amber or my sister who play games regularly, typically I'm playing with some people who don't play games a lot, which means I need to bring a lot like lower um, – threshold for like complexity and death death um death. yes i bring hardcore death to my <laughs> game night I, I admit depth but uh like you know it, it, this was actually an interesting conversation uh paul grogan from gaming rules was doing a live chat and someone talked to, to with him about this and they were essentially he was describing the fact that because people like say you have someone like ua rosenberg Say you play games like feast for odin and all the time like that then because you play those games you might be under the like perception that maybe like Nusvard or whatever the new one is, is like a lighter game. And you're like, oh, Feast for Odin is like my regular fare, so this is lighter. And it's like, if you try to introduce that to people who don't play board games often because you think it's lighter based off of what you play, like that's idiotic. It's just it's just stupid because it, it doesn't like actually fit for that. And then you'll have games like Marvel United, which like, you know, mechanically is very very simple to someone like me but to someone who hasn't played games very often like they have to think about the fact that they need to go to different locations they're not only playing a card but they're using someone else's card and then the card that they're playing is going to be used by someone else they have to like focus on quite a lot of things and so it really depends on who all comes to play and at my house if it's not any one of those like three or four people who are steadily and frequently around me, it's someone that doesn't play a ton of games. And so I have to be like very mindful. Like recently I played uh, the quick and the undead from inside up games. And like, that was fine for me, but it was, it's a language independent game. And I taught that to a couple people who don't play a lot of games. And you know, that 30 to 60 minute game took us like 90 to a hundred minutes and it, 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 it was a rough choice. It was a poor choice on my part to, to do. So I think that it's definitely a contextually different answer for every single person that would answer that question. Um, for me, it comes down to what do I think meets the player count and what do I think meets uh, the requirements for the people. Like Alex and I have had conversations in the past where we have like very visceral responses like – me and him have played three player games and four player games of architects of the West kingdom. And then we played a five player game of architects of the West kingdom. And that pretty much like made me hate the game. And and it's not really, that's not the game's fault. That is our fault for playing it at a maximum player count with an expansion. And one or two of the people who were the five there had never played it before. And Alex and I were the only ones that had played it like three or four times. That was a miserable experience, but it was a game that I, usually love but just at the wrong player count um like so, i said all the games i played with Devin, i'd love to forget them. <laughs> i i just think it's i think it's tough uh, i think i think that's a tough thing to answer and it's different for everyone yeah Meg? yeah i think also talking about what you were saying with different complexity levels something that i'm very very conscious of to not do is to say a game is easy whenever i'm picking out something and saying this is easy oh you'll understand because then if they don't it, it puts people in this vibe of um, they're not understanding something that they should be. So that's something that I've learned to really not say like, oh, you should, oh, this is quick, it's easy. It's just, you know, something like Mosaic, Alex and I, I think are on the same page where they're like, there's just this many actions. It's only one action and there's not that many. But what you're building gets really complex. So for something like that, that's something that in my brain I would be like, oh yeah, it's simple because there's only so many actions and you can easily know exactly what you can do. And then it's up to you to build it. But for a lot of people, it's something that you don't want to bring up so that that way when they are falling behind, they feel like they're not getting something that they should be. Um, Another thing that I love to do if it's a group that isn't experienced gamers is to play co-op. If it's something that you can know what's in their hand or know what you can walk them through, I think that alpha gaming is something that can happen often, so it's something to keep an eye out for. But if it's something that you can gently walk people through a game, um, starting with something that's co-op that adds some complexity like Spirit Island or something like that, um, that's a better way to get people to know more mechanics in games without feeling like they're also competing against other people and like stressed about their score. 
Yeah, the point of it easy is fascinating because now I'm going to have to start paying attention. I'm definitely the type of person who would do that. Not out of any malice, just out of a sense of trying to be helpful. Oh, this is an easy one, but you're you're completely right. That can put pressure on and also make them not want to ask questions, which can make the experience even worse. Um, yep. Because like, oh, I'm not getting the easy thing. That's an excellent point. Uh, for myself, as far as picking a, a game for game night, I think I align somewhat with what Devin was saying to a degree. Uh, the first thing I'll say is, the thing I'm against, always against, is picking a game on the spot. I think that usually <laughs> finds itself in a lot of AP as players don't really have a clear consensus. You're also trying to be the host and trying to be open and welcoming, but they're seeing 200 games, which means they actually want guidance from you, uh, but they're not getting it. And so now everyone feels a little bit in limbo. And I've just found whenever I've tried doing that with like, oh, let's just figure it out. It works if I'm doing it with my core group of people that we know what we all like together. It doesn't work unless you're that core group of myself. Uh, what I try to do for my game night generally is I usually start by, like Devin said, I focus on who who's there and the player count. So we have a player count conversation, we have a complexity conversation, and from there I usually select five or six games from my collection that I think are good choices. I'll send them out in an email or a WhatsApp depending on who's in that particular particular group, and then I'll be like, hey, here are the four or five, and I'll often include like a short note about it, like, hey, this one's like an area control game that you know will be roughly an hour and a half or uh, this one has a lot of betrayal and, and and backstabbing and you know will be like whatever two hours so i try to include a short note so they don't have to feel the pressure to either randomly select or google or whatever and also it can it can give them a reason why they're attracted to it um, i certainly don't even mind um what's the word for it uh, stacking the deck so to speak and picking things that have a more obvious choice for the particular group and question based on their preferences because my goal is that they feel invested in the conversation and decision but also that they don't feel overwhelmed by it at the same time meaning i'm the connoisseur i'm the mater d i'm picking what i think is good based on the player count and the depth and it's not a perfect solution it never is but it often is going to be coming from more of a sense of knowledge than the people coming to the table especially in my great game group where i'm the core gamer and like most of the other people in my game group don't own games. They like playing games. They love the hobby. But yeah. I think, mo like, I have a game group of, like, I don't know, the wider game group somewhere around 20 people. The more core selections around four or five. And maybe two or three of them own games. That's and like 19 more friends than I have. Oh, I didn't say the friends. Please, they don't have to like me. They just have to want my games. <laughs> uh, like, he's G Jeremy Howard's in the chat talking about how, hey, the, his game group has the benefit of they all get to try all the new hotness. Yes, there is that perk. I have a friend yeah. who I mentioned I, the other day. I was like, oh, I can come to your house. It's okay. You come to mine all the time. He's like, yes, I come to your house because you have the games and you teach me the games. I have the most easy, joy-free <laughs> game, playing games experience than anyone I know. Uh, but yeah, so I think that that for me is like, it's about complexity <clears throat> and depth, trying to loop them into the conversation, but also trying to select things you think are good for that audience. Zimbo uh, asked, oh, sorry. Meg, you go. I was just going to say, I think genre helps too. Like if like, giving options of like Calico, because people like pretty colors and patches and cats or like marvel champions because they really like the heroes if it's something that ties you into the game that you have like outside knowledge of i think that helps a lot too yeah yeah sure uh zimbo asked um what is the most complex non-euro game we've played Ooh, the most complex oh i have it i have it i got it okay sword and sorcery Sword and Sorcery. Sword and Sorcery is a dungeon crawler that, I mean, arguably Gloomhaven could fall in that category too, for that matter. They're talking about, yeah, we're talking about these long rule books. They're not Euros. They definitely have Euro aspects to them, especially Gloomhaven is known as being the dungeon crawler that is more uh, more card-driven as opposed to dice-driven, so it has more of that deterministic aspect to it. But uh, for me, I think Sword and Sorcery is the one where I find Gloomhaven is actually not as complicated. Gloomhaven has more rules than Sword and Sorcery. It's slightly longer in terms of the rule book. For me, the thing that killed me about Sword and Sorcery is that I, li I really enjoyed the game. It's a long dungeon crawler, 60-page rule book. I liked it a lot, but then I just found managing the enemies, the AI enemy card was, and it's a thing that I guarantee if you play it five, ten times, it gets a lot easier. But for me, I played it like twice, and like each time, like whenever it was the enemy's turn, I had to like check this card and go through a complex stack of interactions on top of a 60 page rulebook of how much stuff is going on. And overall, I found that I was not as compelled as I would like by the experience to want to constantly do that. I was like, this is really fun. This mm -hmm. is really good. In fact, one thing I'm very excited about is I know that I saw the announcement that they're bringing Sword and Sorcery to the Taboo system. The Taboo system, which manages all your things with the app. And I actually thought that was an excellent an excellent match, because I think Sword and Sorcery was a great game that I didn't want to manage a lot of the elements. And I think putting it on Taboo is a good uh, matchup for trying to bring you the game with less complexity. Hmm. What about you, Meg? I think Gloomhaven, just off like the top of my head, which I love that complexity. I 
love heavier games that um for something like that alex i've never played the one that you said but something like running the monsters in gloomhaven it is a lot it's a lot of upkeep and even knowing things like monster movement and how things spawn and things like that um it is tricky but i love it i absolutely love upkeep i love rules i love knowing where things should be um i enjoy that a lot and Devin, for you? Yeah, so I think part of what Alex was talking about made me think that, like, I feel like there's almost, like, two different answers to that. Because, like, if it if I'm thinking about complex, I'm thinking about whether, like, whether the game is complex. But then also you mentioned rule books, And I think that sometimes a poorly designed and written rule book can make a not as complex game complex to learn. Um and for me, like, I, like I'm thinking about when I first got into the hobby back when I was, well, not first got into the hobby, first started reviewing content and, you know, being more um, in like the, you know, review content creation space uh, when I was in Texas and Navajo Wars, which is a like military or history simulation game um, from GMT uh, who did stuff like, you know, Twilight Struggle and all that. Um, Navajo Wars game. was like a really, really dense rule book for me at the time. I don't I don't own the game anymore. Um, and, you know, I only played it a, a couple times. But uh, that one was a really dense one to try to, like, digest. Um, just opening up the rule book for John Company, uh, I'm just like, oh, my dear goodness. <laughs> so if you um, recall, Devin, when you invited me the other week to play John Com- <laughs> Company, I was like, I would love to do that at some point. I just don't have the patience oh. for that right now. Cloud Spire is a good pick, Sacabra. Cloud Spire is a good pick too. I will say Chip Theory is getting better at rule books. Like yes. they have grown so much over the years in terms of making rule books better. Like Burn Cycle was their best to date, and I don't have Hoplomachus yet. Um, I know Alex still has his copy. Uh, screw you, um, but I don't have. Printings, apparently. What'd you say? Apparently, it has misprintings, I believe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there was a whole announcement. The whole but, uh, hop yeah, got delayed cool. because they had duplicate copies of enemies. And I was like, remember, Meg, if you remember when we were playing, remember how there would frequently be duplicates of the enemies you're fighting? Apparently, that's a mistake. <laughs> you can be like, why is it this one again? <laughs> yes. So, apparently, that's a huge mistake. And so, our, we have advanced one of a kind copies that um, will now go on <laughs> eBay for $470,000. Oh, man. So, we've been cheating and I have, like, three of those dollars. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Petrified. Petrified. <laughs> you unboxed a copy. <laughs> yeah, I did. I wonder what what copy that was. He unboxed my right. copy. My, in my stealth basement. unboxing. Uh, yeah, but- someone in my comments on my video uh, when I did when I posted that went, "You organized it better than it was the first time," and they're like, "He's gonna know." <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna know because it's organized. Nobody's better. gonna know. How would they know? How would they know? But uh, yeah, a bunch of other comments as far as other options. I do think Too Many Bones is a uh, most trip their games. I do think are a slog to learn through. But I think that once you get them yeah. up and running, they're very good. Mage Knight is an excellent choice. That every time I play it, I have to relearn it. Uh, I think it's a very tough one. I saw Food Chain Magnet. Although I do think Food Chain Magnet is a more brain burnery than complicated. I think it's actually very simple in the actions. Um, but I think it's very like like uh, Sreb me said Food Chain Magnet definitely makes me leave the table and go home. The year I played Food Chain Magnet, it was the number three game of all time. But as time went on, I found that Food Chain Magnet is a game that I have to be in a very specific mood to play it because it's such a mental slog to go through. And I find that I'm very I am very particular about when I play it, and because that's also dropped, it's like like my memory like thirty of all time, which is still good, but like definitely dropped because of that. So there's lots of lots of good choices as far as complicated games. There there's a real lot, quick yeah. Let's inverse the question. What's yes. the least complex Euro you've played? Ooh. The least complex Euro. I mean, you can get really dumbed down really quickly. I assume you want something good. Are you talking about just me personally? Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot. Because, like, like, Baron Park's a Euro, and it's incredibly accessible. Mm-hmm. But if we're talking about, like, more classic, arguably heavier Euros that are still incredibly simple to dive into... I don't know if I have great options. I think Aquatica is incredibly solid. I think Aquatica is very, very accessible and also gives you a lot of decision space. I think I'm going to go with the classic Lords of Waterdeep. Ooh, good choice. Good choice. That is that is hardcore. Do you know, I just found out the designer for Lords of Waterdeep is the same person who did Tyrants of the Underdark. Did not realize that. Really? Yeah. Peter Lees, I believe. No. 
Yeah. yeah, Jeremiah Peel. Like, yeah, I agree with you. Ticket to Ride is a great choice for a very accessible, simple Euro. That's why, like, I'm trying to balance like what I think of as being more into the medium heavy while still being incredibly easy. Yeah. Yeah, I like Ticket to Ride a lot. I wouldn't even have thought of that. Swemmy wants yeah, to know if Swemmy was a debate definition of Euro, which I think with the five minutes and Alex's hard it's cutoff, perfect. it's a great time to start that debate. No, let's it's do a it. great time to start that it. debate. Let's do it. Let's you want to do that in five minutes? <laughs> well, four minutes now. Yeah. <laughs> Are we uh, debating word, how many minutes are left? Do we want to save it for next week's topic? Uh, we could. We could. Just, we'll certainly put it on. Let's put it on the poll at the very least. What is a Euro? Okay. That's Put a stupid question. Poll. Writing yeah. it down. Oh, yeah. That's basically it. That's going to be our first uh, our, our first weekly live stream. Uh, this is going to be coming back next week, possibly with the same topic. Possibly, I'm sorry, possibly the same structure. Hopefully not the same <laughs> topic. That would be a terrible idea. <laughs> Let's do this all over again. So, hey, guys, how do you pick a night game for game night? <laughs> exactly. My um, answer has changed in the last seven days. Yeah, so appreciate all of you tuning in for the first inaugural live stream. Uh, we'll be back next week. Um, and actually, that'll be fun to manage because, well, we'll figure it out. But yes, we will we'll get all taken care of. Uh, appreciate all of you tuning in. Uh, any feedback at all about the show and comments and live stream and Patreon, wherever it is, always helpful. Our, our goal is to basically hang out and have fun, uh, hopefully be entertaining as well. So that's where your part of the conversation comes and in. And it's my guys' goal to make sure we shut Alex up enough to where, you know... He can't talk the whole time. It's just, it's big effort. It's tough. It's tough. And to end our first inaugural stream, can we all high five? I think uh, yeah, that's nope. about, about the one I was. Oh wait, wait, well. wait. So I I have to go this way and down. I, I think you're going way? the wrong way. Okay. Okay. Oh, because okay. I'm mirrored. It mirrored me. I got. So it. I have to I go this it. way. It's easy for me. Yeah, I got it. I have to go this way? I let's think, did I go this way? Let's just do it. I, but the delay, uh, on go. my end, the delay. Go. Just do it. It's going to take go. a while. There we go, It's yes. going to take a while. Yeah, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. <laughs> it's going to be really entertaining for the podcast. We'll practice. Yeah. We'll practice. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, oh, thanks so much goodness. for tuning in. We're going to call it, and we'll see you next week. Bye. See you guys. Bye. Bye.